started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him saying, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Rescue me. Meeting Jesus in the water. The summer I graduated from college, I embarked on one of the most ridiculous and challenging journeys of my life. It was a trip to the Himalayan mountains where I would hike and camp for the very first time. Absolutely ridiculous. Now let me tell you, my relationship with the outdoors at this point was pretty much non-existent. I was the type to give up on the gym after one semester. Even walking a mile around track field left me exhausted. My idea of exercise was strolling down the street to pick up a food order. And to add to the challenge, I'm actually very quite anemic, so I get very easily exhausted and fatigued. So as you can imagine, heading into this trip, I was far from prepared. In fact, that summer marked my first visit to an outdoor gear store like REI, had never been, and I was clueless about what I would need, the hiking essentials, that I would have to have with me. Armed with nothing but eagerness and a belief that I could conquer anything. I mean, I had just graduated college. I set out to take on the world. Little did I know how challenging this adventure would be, not just for me, but everyone who had to be around me. Hiking and camping alone in any place has its own set of challenges requiring physical strength, knowledge of terrain and safety, patience, and courage. Now, Pitchker doing all of this for the first time in the Himalayan mountains at an intense altitude of about 13,000 feet. It was cold, rocky. The terrain is just unpredictable. Hours of hiking all day at a stretch with few breaks was the norm each day. Amidst the physical challenges that I experienced, whether it was my feet and their inability to do what I wanted them to do or my anemia, which caused me to have to constantly take breaks, what truly surprised me during this trip was how I learned to pray <laughs> and rely on those around me. My vulnerabilities on this trip were laid bare. There was no place to hide. My fears of mountain lions, bugs, slipping and falling. There were moments where I had to pause gasping for breath or take extended breaks to hydrate and muster the strength to continue. There were paths where I doubted my ability to climb or jump or even take one step forward. There were times where I slipped and fell, wondering if this journey would be the end of me. And those feelings of vulnerability never really went away. But the thing that did change in the midst of fear and doubt was that I realized that I was never alone. The people around me quickly became family, offering support, encouragement, even physical assistance when needed. Again, as I said, I was not in shape at all and probably should have trained before this trip. 
But in that experience, we coached each other through tough spots, lending literal and metaphorical shoulders to lean on. I found myself relying on other people in ways I never had before. Whether it was a late night bathroom break, can you help me dig a hole? <laughs> or a helping hand on treacherous terrain. Though fear and doubt gripped me like never before, those mountains became a place of grace and empowerment where I had discovered my inner strength, learned the power of prayer and the beauty of being rescued and supported. In moments of need, I was humbled and uplifted by the kindness of my fellow travelers. It was a journey of doubt and vulnerability but also of profound growth and the realization that sometimes being in need is the first step towards salvation, that feeling of being rescued. Doubt surprisingly became the very thing that strengthened me because it allowed me to explore the depths of support and the depths of my own strength. In our passage today, the disciples find themselves in their own challenging terrain. They are engulfed by the raging sea, grappling with relentless waves and fierce winds. And the text says that in the darkest hours of the night, when exhaustion weighed heavy on them, Jesus emerges, walking on the surface of the water. And in this moment, he does not merely present himself as their teacher. Now he reveals himself as the great I am, one who has power even over the water, the ultimate source of power and reassurance amidst the chaos. As the night wears on and the disciples struggle to keep afloat, I thought of myself trying to keep forward on the hiking the Himalayan mountains. Jesus's arrival would have come during the early morning hours from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Alone amidst the threatening waves for hours, the disciples were depleted of their energy and resolve, so much so that they failed to recognize Jesus as he is coming towards them. In their moment of crisis and weariness, though, Jesus reveals his true nature, confirming his authority and strength over the water. Despite the circumstances, Jesus moves through the water with remarkable composure. Waves crash around him. The text says the wind is howling and the sea becomes the symbol not only of personal, interpersonal chaos, but also a symbol of the political oppression that they all were living through. Yet Jesus does not approach with anxiety or dominance over it. He simply just walks through it. He remains unfazed by the fury around him, exuding this sense of calm and tranquility. He embodies a non-anxious presence that brings comfort and ease to those around him. Peter, known for his eager spirit and impulsive nature, wastes no time in responding to Jesus. However, as he steps out of the safety of the boat, his heart is torn between faith and doubt. Despite his eagerness to follow Jesus, doubts undoubtedly plague his mind. Lord, if that's really you, prove it to me, he says. Perhaps he also questions the physical impossibility of walking on water or the wisdom of leaving the security of the boat behind. Yet Peter does not wait until he feels no more doubt or fear. He does not wait until he has his science or theology all figured out. He has no idea if he's going to walk or sink. In the midst of uncertainty, he demonstrates remarkable courage to step off the boat. 
His willingness to step out onto the water at all is a leap of faith into the unknown. A writer at Enfleshed wrote these words, that first step that Peter takes can be one of the hardest ones. The moment he chooses that the risk is worth it and takes an action, the moment he steps out from the pack who is afraid and staying in the shelter of the boat, the moment he moves from making all of his decisions based on what he has learned will keep him safe and puts his body on the line for something else, something bigger. Even getting to this moment of courage is no small feat. And it's no less spectacular when we take any first step, a first protest, a first time speaking up for ourselves, a first move away towards listening, who keeps us listening to things that in the past have kept us safe through our privilege when there are more important things than safety. A first time we choose to make ourselves vulnerable before or beside others. In our context, it would be like the first time you hold hands with your partner in public. The first time you introduce yourself with a new name and new pronouns. The first time you enter into an industry or institution that has been majority white and you are not. In this moment, Peter's courage is palpable, his trust in Jesus unwavering. Yet, as the reality of his surroundings sink in, so does Peter. And while many interpretations of this text focus on Peter's moment of doubt and failure, what strikes me the most is Jesus's immediate response of rescue. In Peter's moment of faltering, Jesus is already right there, prepared to save. Jesus doesn't meet him with judgment or condemnation but with his unwavering presence, extending a helping hand without hesitation at all. As Nadia Boltz Weber put it, she says, if there was any failure on the part of the disciples, I don't think it was finding a storm at sea terrifying because come on, that's legit scary. I think their failure was not unlike ours believing that if their lives were screwed, that must mean God is far off. Their failure was in buying the lie that calm waters are the only proof of God's presence. Despite Peter's doubt causing him to slip, it doesn't deter Jesus at all. It doesn't cause Jesus to run away. Instead, this experience teaches Peter this valuable lesson. One, that having Jesus in his life doesn't keep him from dangerous situations. But it assures him that he will never be alone. He will always be met with grace and love. As one writer says, Peter has stepped out in vulnerability and it is only inevitable that his fear would kick in as he steps onto the water. It's a new experience for him. And like most new experiences, we don't quite have our footing yet. He has not yet built the internal tools that he needs to withstand the wind once it blows. He has faith, but it needs to grow. So Peter learns that being friends with Jesus doesn't mean that troubles will go away. He also learns the second thing, that doubt is a natural and necessary part of maturing in his faith. A mature faith is one that has been tested and tried, where doubts are acknowledged and confronted, ultimately leading to a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. Doubt, as a part of faith and maturation, acknowledges the complexity of human experience 
Peter is never one thing in this story. He's not all faith. He's not all doubt. He feels both in one moment. Doubt is an acknowledgement that our faith isn't stagnant, but it is dynamic. It is evolving. It can change second to second, moment to moment. It is doubt that challenges us to wrestle with our beliefs, confront uncertainties, and ultimately deepen our understanding of faith. Doubt can serve as a refining fire, stripping away superficial or unexamined beliefs. It prompts us to ask tough questions, to seek answers, and ultimately arrive at a faith that is not simply inherited, but one that is truly ours. I think back to myself in those mountains and how doubting my abilities actually transformed my understanding of myself and my community. If I hadn't doubted, I wouldn't have matured into a person who finds strength in community or who understands the power of prayer in each moment. Through this experience, Peter comes to understand that doubt is not incompatible with faith. It is a part of the journey of maturing and relying on God. By confronting his doubts and facing his fears, Peter learns to trust God's unwavering presence in his life. His journey teaches us that doubt can serve as a catalyst for growth and transformation rather than something to be feared or suppressed. As we confront our doubts and uncertainties, we too are invited to remember that Jesus is close by. Jesus's rescuing hand is already ready to save and catch us. Knowing that even in the midst of our doubts, God remains steadfast and ever present, ready to lift us up. Like Peter, we also grapple with uncertainty and fear like I did wrestling with some challenging terrain. We question whether we have the strength to weather life's storms, to navigate its waters. We find ourselves often standing on the shores of the unknown, unsure of what lies ahead. In these moments, we may doubt our own abilities, feel overwhelmed by the challenges that confront us. Even after we take the first step off the boat, there's still the wind that challenges all of us to doubt ourselves. The dangers in our lives may take on any number of characteristics. Embarking on a journey of identity exploration, whether it involves coming out, transitioning, exploring one's cultural identity, whether it's dealing with our own health issues or someone that we love, coping with our changing bodies and abilities throughout life. Maybe it's financial hardship, switching faith communities, having your beliefs challenged, going through a change in relationship, living through national and global crises like gun violence and climate change and war. All of these things can generate fear and uncertainty. They can be like the wind that stops us after we take a step off the boat. Each of these circumstances may tug at our sense of security. They may require us to step out onto unfamiliar terrain, making ourselves vulnerable, having to rely on people in ways that we never thought we would need to. They might make us question take on new forms of understanding, take on risk, ask people things you never thought you would ask, like me in the middle of the night, can you help me dig a hole in the mountains? And so as we reflect on the story of Peter walking on water, we are reminded of its profound truth that in the face of doubt and uncertainty, we find solace not just in Peter's slip up, but in the immediate rescue offered by Jesus, who is constant and steadfast, reaching out to lift us up. Through his experience of doubt, Peter matures and learns to trust in the nearness of God, 
discovering that faith is not about the absence of doubt, but often right next to it, that we can lean on God's presence even in the storm. Just as Jesus was there for Peter in this moment of need, so too he is present for each of us, ready to extend his hand of rescue and guidance. As we navigate uncertainties, may we find courage in stepping out, knowing that we are never alone and that through faith we can learn to mature and trust in the unwavering presence of God. So let us embrace doubt as a catalyst for growth and transformation. And may we journey forward with confidence, knowing that God is with us every step of the way. Amen. And now is your opportunity to share how this message might be moving in you and what might be bubbling up on the surface. I liked what you said to use doubt um, as like a, like doubt as like a knowledge to be, you know, normally you think about doubting something. It's like, you want to run away from that. I don't want to doubt that. I don't, you know, that's too scary for me, but to think about using doubt as like a path forward, you know, I think about the journey that my son is on mm -hmm. in his relationship and, you know, to kind of look at something that you normally is viewed as, is you don't want to doubt anything, you know, that's, that's negative. And Ryan has been a, he's a very positive person. And to think about that, that's interesting. I, I like that analogy. Um, I love the analogy of the hand. Mm. Um, like that's, that's really, that's personally powerful for me to know that that hand is always going to be there mm -hmm. uh, no matter what, you know, challenges I have in my life. So it's a great message. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's very funny that you went to the Himalayas your first camping slash hiking trip. So there's this thing called like Iron Hill Mountain or the Poconos or <laughs> Appalachian Trail. No, you no. go to the hill. Oh my lord! It wasn't. It wasn't the home. smartest thing I've ever done, but it was. It was worth it. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that reflection. Yeah. I think doubt is one of those things that we are afraid of because we don't have control when we doubt. We don't know where it's going to lead. We are taught that it's something that we shouldn't feel at all. And um, I, I lift up doubt because I always think that it can get us to a place that's deeper and more authentic. Like if Peter didn't have that moment, would he have recognized Jesus in the same way? Would he have had that deep connection if he hadn't had this experience? Um, and so it, it launches him into a more authentic uh, disciple, really strengthens him for, for the rest of his spiritual journey. Yeah. I would love to hear some more about your trip sometimes <laughs> that, that just, it's mind blowing. Um, and I have, I, that was an amazing sermon. I have so many thoughts and I'm sure I'm going to forget some of them. Um, one of the things that you and Brent have taught me is the things that weren't said, think about the things that weren't said. Mm. Um, and I think about what if, what would that story have been like if Peter hadn't stepped out of the boat, mm. <clears throat> we still would have a story. Jesus would have still come across the water. He would have still come into the boat, but that would have completely, and we could see he, that he had this power over the water, but it wouldn't connect to our humanity. Mm, yes. So that was one thing. The other thing was do, in that passage or later, does he say anything? Does Jesus say anything to the disciples about Peter's fate? Does he say anything after the fact? Like, does he admonish them for not having enough faith to get out of the boat? No, it's hard okay. to know kind of how they respond or what the yeah. conversation with the rest of the people is like. Right. Um, but but to me, the thing is, as you were starting to tell that story, I'm like, yeah, I would have been on the, I would have been like, we need to stay in the boat, you know, <laughs> that the, the, the water is rough, you know, I mean, I could see how, and then there's that whole group of people that Jesus also doesn't judge. Why weren't you brave like Peter? Why didn't you do those things? Because sometimes 
our doubt is too great to even get out of the boat. Yeah. But he still calmed the water for the whole group. Yeah. So there's, there's the huge example of being like Peter, but he still saves everybody else or protects everybody else. So I think it's, there's times where we're not brave enough, Mm -hmm. but Peter can be the reminder that we can do it because he's by our side, but he's still by their side too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the stories, I mean, Peter is the only one. Peter initiates all of this. Um, they all are afraid. They all see Jesus. They all think he's a ghost. Uh, but Peter, because he is so eager and impulsive, as we, you know, kind of describe him, he's the only one who asks the question and, and kind of puts Jesus to the test. Like, if it's you, you know, tell me to tell me to walk too. And and he didn't have to do that. Um, but you know, Peter kind of sets himself apart from the rest of them very often. Um, and so he has this moment of faith and doubt and all of these things. Uh, but it's really fascinating. It would be interesting to hear how the other disciples, you know, responded or what Jesus's conversation with the rest of them would have been like. Mm hmm. Well, as you know, I'm interested in languages. And what just occurred to me is, I mean, I've always thought that Jesus was just talking to Peter. But looking at it from a linguist's, uh, you know, point of view, I'm thinking he would have said thou of little faith. He said ye, which means plural, you guys mm -hmm. of little faith. Or maybe it was translated wrong. I don't know any latin or greek or aramaic or whatever but um i mean just ye does it's like oh come all ye faithful that's plural and it would be thou or thee if he just meant like one person just occurred to me i think he i think he did mean all of them it's just just yeah. dawning on me I mean, it's very often that um, that that happens in in Jesus's teachings that we sort of interpret it as being about one person in the story or about just us specifically. But very often Jesus is speaking to a group of people um, or even when he's talking to one person, he has an audience. And so um, I think that that yeah, that's true and something to explore to add a layer to to the story. Hi, I just wanted to comment on something that I appreciate that is a recurring theme throughout stories like this is that when it comes to the trust of his disciples, Jesus goes through the path of it is okay for trust to be something that is earned instead of something I'm demanding of you and punishing you for if you don't give me on day one. Mm. And that he gives people the time and the patience to build up that trust because if his disciples met him today, it would be kind of scary if some guy that you met on the street went, yes, just do this. I know it contradicts your entire reality, but trust me, man. Um, and I just think that like when trust is built slowly and steadily and without punishment for where it wavers, it creates such a beautiful, solid, healthy, strong bond. And I very dearly appreciate that um, Jesus allows his disciples to build that trust level bit mm -hmm. by bit, uh, even if they waver even if they question even if they don't step off right away mm. that's beautiful Theo yeah I think that this is a I think looking at this series um through Lent this is one of my favorite stories um because often we focus on the end of the story we know that Peter becomes this you know he he becomes one of the biggest leaders of the church he becomes this cornerstone he becomes this rock all of these things and yet this is one of those stories that reminds us of those moments of slip up those moments of learning those moments of growing that it takes to to get to that level these these are the moments that shape our faith and that are more realistic in the journey um and so before we you know praise people or are amazed by what they've done we have to remember these moments uh this was a time where peter learns to trust 
and Jesus doesn't respond to him with condemnation, we can think of Jesus's question as a reassurance uh, that he's there. Um, and a quick moment to admit one of my weaker areas of knowledge. I'm horrific with geography. Like I thought that Boston was in Maryland until I was 18 or 19. <laughs> like I'm very bad with geography Um, for the sake of understanding better. Can I have a reminder of where the Himalayas are? And are they like really big? They are very oh, big <laughs> and very, very high and very dangerous. <laughs> um, so again, not a, not a smart decision on my part. Um, but they are um, across a few different places. I was in the northern part of India, um, but there's also Nepal and other places that they, that they touch. Um, so, yeah. And we'll check on Zoom to see if there's any other comments or thoughts. Um. Aaron says, beautiful message, Brooke. And Jasmine says, our family is, as Lulu describes, neurospicy. Fear, anxiety, and doubt has kept us from so many experiences. Um, last week, as a family, we traveled to P Pittsburgh, which was a five-hour drive, stood outside in 17-degree weather for almost two hours, and sat in a room with over 15 a thousand people together in our first concert together. We got to see our favorite artists, J. Cole and Drake, one of the greatest experiences of our lives. We may doubt in the future of what we've got in our own way uh, this one time, and we were rewarded with an experience of a lifetime. Hmm. Beautiful, beautiful reflection. Yeah, of just stepping out and doing the things that you know, feel risky to us um, and knowing that God is there to catch us and God in the form of people who are also supporting us as well. Awesome. Well, thank you. And I pray that this message of Peter and his rescue continues to move you as we continue throughout Lent. So thank you.